I have insurance and so I don't need to focus on anything else other than just my physical well-being because a bike is completely replaceable and the fact that you have insurance and that you're protected and you're covered all you need to do is focus on yourself and getting yourself better like I'm gonna try and I'm gonna take risks and I'm gonna take chances because why else why would you not right I'm Alicia Speak I'm 37 I'm a full-time lawyer but I'm also a cyclist for Cycle Team London yeah. I'm Simon Brotherton. This is my first time in the Ruler Classic Theatre. Uh, as a cycling commentator, coming here and, and speaking to people like this was a, an opportunity that I certainly uh, didn't want to miss. Well, who have we got lined up for you today? Well, we've got a, we've got a pretty special lineup. Among the highlights, Giro d'Italia winner, uh, Damiano Cunego will be here in, in a little while having a chat with us. Uh, Giro d'Italia and Vuelta stage winner Sam Bennett is going to be on stage later this afternoon. Three-time Tour de France winner Greg LeMond as well later on at tea time. And the first Australian, indeed the first non-European ever to wear the coveted maillot jaune in the Tour, Phil Anderson. That's one that I'm particularly looking forward to as well. So... Uh, Without further ado, let, let's get on with it. You'll probably know the vo voice rather more than the face, so we thought that we'd introduce him to you today. Please welcome up onto stage the voice of Radio Tour, Seb Piquet. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Hello, hello, hello. Ah, bonjour, monsieur. Bienvenue, welcome. Merci, on fait ça en français. Ah, right. <laughs> So uh, it's the it's the it's the off season, Seb. Oh, I mean, yes. the cyclists, some of the riders, they they put their bike away in the garage for a little while. What, what do you do? I mean, do, do you put the the walkie-talkie down for a few weeks? Yes, yes. But uh, you know, at the end of the season, you have to prepare for the next one, and you have uh, events like this one, which it's great to be back uh, at uh, the UCI Gala in China was a week ago, and you start getting ready for the season to come, and start studying. Start studying. Uh, the, the preparation never stops. Um, what does your job actually involve? We say, you know, radio tour. Who are you speaking to? What's, what's it really for? So the idea is to give as much information to as many people as possible during the Tour de France. Uh, be factual. Give facts. So uh, I basically work from the red car behind the peloton, and, we, and I speak to... Uh, in priority to the, uh, to the teams, to the team managers in the cars behind me, in case there's a puncture or a, or, or a bottle required. Uh, I speak to journalists like Simon Brotherton, who is uh, uh, at the finish line. I've woken up in the middle of the night in July with Seb's voice ringing around in, in, in my head. What a nightmare. I, every day in July for several hours, you know, periodically I hear S Seb coming through on the race radio. But actually for people like me, and Rob Hales, who would be alongside me, or Chris Baldwin or whoever, it's essential because other than the pictures that you're seeing at home, we don't really have this extra information. So, you know, if certain riders Neither need assistance, or, you know, we've got, there are punctures or issues, sometimes uh, crashes out on the route, it's, mm. it's Seb that is the first provider of that. Yeah. And Accu also accuracy is key, isn't it, for you? It's yes, and, I, and, I, and to be honest, I can't really afford to be wrong because if I'm wrong and if I say something wrong, it has repercussions in the team cars, but also because the journalist might say something uh, wrong because of me. So, yeah, so again, I, I, we, I speak to the, to the team managers, to the, uh, to the journalists, and also to uh, the, the guests who are uh, following the race in VIP cars. So that's why I, I tend to also talk about the history of the Tour de France, the villages that we go through, the cuisine, the wine, the saucisson. Yeah, and you talk about the race occasionally to Eventually, them as well, Eventually, yeah, every now and again. Um, we've got um, some footage, actually, I think, which hmm? shows you in action and gives a little bit of a flavour of, of what your, your job entails yeah. during well, the tour. Yeah, because the, the, the idea of this video is to show that uh, I'm, I'm not on my own, obviously, and it's a real uh, teamwork. So on the tour, as I explained, I'm, uh, I'm in the red car behind the peloton. Voila. Voila. Um, and obviously, I can't see what goes on at the front of the race. Now that, you forget about that. Um, and, 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 and so I have 
one, two, three motorbikes that are at the front of the race, my eyes on the Tour de France. This man here is called Bruno Thibault. He was a former rider. He rode the Tour de France several times for Castorama. And now he works uh, for the organization of the Tour de France. He's on a bike and he's at the front of the race and he explains what goes on. So he's with the breakaway group. He will tell me who is in the breakaway group. He will give me gaps with the peloton. And so without him, there is no radio tour. Uh, all the information he gives me uh, are given on a specific channel. And then I, I, and then I, will, I will give that information on radio tour for everyone to, to hear. So they, they're, 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 their work is absolutely crazy. So your, yours is a, is a horrible job if you suffer from car sickness, isn't it? it well, trying to it scribble can, away sitting it, in the passenger seat. There. It can be. It was a bit at the beginning. But their job is, is a lot harder because they have three uh, stopwatches. They ride the bikes on their own. They, they have no one with them. And so they, 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 they do the, the whole thing. So right there, you, you can see him. He's at the top of the climb, giving me the top three and giving me the gaps. And then they have to go downhill, fight their way through the cars to get back to the breakaway group. He is one of the most amazing drivers I've ever seen. Uh, and I think it's also because he was a former cyclist that he does this job. He knows exactly how the riders react. He knows how to avoid crashes, where to be positioned on the road, and um, that's Radio Tour. Um, when I started covering the Tour de France in the 90s, um, speaking English was greatly frowned upon. I do remember somebody once asking a question in a press conference in English, and there was a lot of hissing Ooh la la. and booing. <laughs> they were shouted down, and, yeah, so right. um, and the question wasn't taken. Things have changed a lot since then. Yeah. Um, how many languages do you need to use? Uh, and what is the predominant one that's well, spoken on Radio Tour? I, I tend to, 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 to say that the most important is to be understood by the most people as, uh, as possible. So I, uh, I do Radio Tour in French and in English, and I add a bit of Spanish if necessary, if there's a, a Spanish uh, rider in the breakaway, uh, or, or if I need to give him important information on a, on a Spanish or South American rider uh, crashing. But the most important is to speak English, and French, so that everyone understands. How did, how did this job come about? I mean, it's not the sort of thing you see <coughs> advertised, is it, in, back in the day, in Miroir yeah. de Cyclisme or something like that? Yeah, no, yeah, I've, I've, I, I knew about Radio Tour, but uh, I never applied. Uh, I was, at the time, I was working for an, another event uh, organized by ASO called the Dakar, it's a rally, and uh, the people from ASO knew that I spoke French and English, they knew that I, I liked cycling, and John Lelong, who used to be a race radio speaker at the time, uh, was given a job by Phonak to become the, the team manager of Phonak. So he left ASO and they were looking for someone. And they asked, asked me if I wanted to, uh, to, to give it a go and uh, asked me to go to Qatar to test myself out. And that was my first race in Qatar in the beginning of uh, 2005. Uh, Robbie Hunter won that race, I remember, and, and, et voila. and then I carried on, uh, did the whole Tour of Qatar, apparently worked pretty well, and then I did Paris-Nice, Rue Roubaix, Tour de France. When Every time I see you, you uh, out and about at races, you always come across as being very relaxed, as if everything is in hand. Um, is it a stressful job though? Is it more stressful than it looks? <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, it, 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 it has to be stressful because if you don't have that stress, you're not serious about it. And it's a serious yeah. job, uh, despite the champagne in the car and, 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 and the saucisson. But um, yeah, it is stressful. But I, I tend to always remember what um, Bernard Rinault told me uh, the first year I did uh, race radio. It was probably on Paris Nice. And he came up to me and said, Oh, son, you know, Bernard Rinault, five time winner of the Tour de France. Hey, kid. Uh, what you do is, is good, it's good, but stay calm, stay calm. Don't show any stress because if you show stress, everyone's going to panic. The, 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 the team managers are going to drive like crazy. So even if there's a massive crash, stay as calm as possible. And I think he's right. And is that the most challenging part of the job sometimes? To stay calm? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, the most challenging part of the job is, 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 uh, is, is when you have to, to stop for, for natural reasons. That's the, that's the most challenging part of the, stop, the, of the job. Um, but um, 
you, I mean, you, you know what it's like when you, do, you, you commentate a race. You, you tend to get excited when you go up a, a mountain and, and, and there, are, there are attacks. But that's all right. You, you can get excited about that. You just have to stay calm when there's a crash because you need to give as much information as possible on who's in the crash uh, because, because it has repercussions. One of the more entertaining things I find when we're, we're covering a race, and as I say, we're... we're We've got the, the, the sound of the road, they call it international sound, in our ears. So we, we can hear the crowd at the roadside, the wheels on the road. It helps us to sort of concentrate. We're watching a TV screen on the finishing line. But at the same time, we can hear radio tours. So we can hear everything that's going on in the race or everything that, that they're pre prepared to tell us and, and put on. Um, and one of the entertaining things that I find is when, you, when you're telling people off and you're, you're telling people they're in the wrong place or to get back. I mean. Does that come from what you can see? Or again, have you got well, spotters on bikes that are saying, well, you know, Astana, or their, their car's too close, or motorbikes getting too close to the no, action, it, it, television cameras? Yeah, it, it mainly comes from what we see. Uh, the, the, the guy who, who tends to, to, to yell on race radio is, is not me. Uh, it's uh, Thierry Gouvenou, who's the race director, sitting just behind me in the car. Uh, and he obviously uh, wants the, the, the race to be as safe as, as, as possible and without uh, in, in incident, outside incidents. Um, but yeah, it's mainly what we see. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're behind the pack, but we still see if a, if a TV motorbike is too close uh, from the peloton and we tell, we tell them to yell. We also have race regulators who, who, who give us some, some information. And um, yeah, we, we see quite a few things. I mean, we're four in the car, so quite yeah. a few eyes there. And in terms of, of all of the teams that are behind the race, you know, they all want to be in the best position to help their riders out when they need to be. I mean, is it a bit like having a classroom full of kids where you know... There's an that, order. That, right. Yeah, yeah, but, there's a, but within that, do you know that there are some of them that will push it as much as possible? Do some of them you know they're going to misbehave and, and make your life a little bit more difficult by yes. just trying to push right up to the line? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to mention any names of, of team managers, but some are some 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 are, are are living their life on that race, and they will push. They will be at the limit. I mean, uh, you can tell us if you want. There's only us here. Yeah, sure. No uh, well, just I mean yeah, the, the World Championships because I also work on the World Championships in in on doing race radio well, in Yorkshire. What a difficult race that was. It was no, it was all right, just a few drops of rain. Um, <laughs> uh, and and we, were, we were actually hit by a, a car from a country that I will not mention, Belgium, who was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're, they're crazy. I mean, and they will do absolutely anything to uh, be of assistance uh, to uh, a rider, whether it's a leader or, or a, a water carrier. Are, um, are motorbikes becoming more of a problem you know you got more motorbikes yeah i mean as the, the race gets bigger and bigger it seems i mean there are limits on it but you know is it more of an issue in the last few years you know it's motos the, 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 no, and the riders and the peloton no uh, because uh we try to be as safe as possible and there are no we don't have more motorbikes on the tour of france for instance we yeah. actually have less People don't see that, but we have we've, we've yeah. reduced to reduce what was a bit of a problem. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But, the, but you, there no, no, you don't have more motorbikes. Uh, um, thanks to the UCI, uh, the, the the bikers and and car drivers are trained. They need to have a specific license to be able to 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 to, to, to drive in um in 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 a race, and experience is what makes the difference. So. Uh, you just need to be cautious and you need to remind everyone of how important safety is. And I think that's what we try to do as, as often as possible. How many tours have you done now in that role? Uh, hang on. Uh, uh, when did you start? Uh, 2005. And quite a few bottles of champagne. This there. year was a pretty good vintage, wasn't it? Not too bad, was it? Yeah, it was. Huh? I think it was pretty good, yeah. Vive la France, monsieur. Well, France coming back to the fore a little bit with uh, yeah. Julien Alaphilippe. Yeah. I mean, you must have... I know, I know you're concentrating on what you're doing, yeah, but I, I can't. you must have, I know, you must I know, have noticed I know at the next, roadside. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. enthusiasm, it sort of rekindled. I mean, not that France was out of love with its race, not by any stretch, but the, the enthusiasm. It makes a massive difference. Yeah, it the, makes a the massive love difference. for the tour really seemed to come through again this year. Yes, but the French, like, I mean, if you had a, if you, if you a three-week... Uh, Grand Tour in Great Britain, the people would, would maybe not be as enthusiastic if you didn't have a, a British rider fighting, fighting for victory. So yeah, it makes a massive difference. 
Uh, and, and the style of rider that he is as e well. Exactly. The style of rider that uh, Julien Alaphilippe is, uh, the person he, the, how friendly he is, how fun he is uh, for people of 12 to 85 and more. Uh, he, he speaks to people, you know. He has this style, he has the way of talking. He has the way of just that way of in, uh, answering interviews that uh, make him a very interesting character. Well, you mentioned interviews. Um, you are a bit of a plate spinner, aren't you? <laughs> at, at races like the Tour de France, because Seb spends the day, as we've been talking about, in the car, but also as if, as if by magic, appears immediately after the stage in the mix zone area for what is the flash interview, the first interview, the one that goes all around the world. How, I mean. You literally like screeching to a halt and <laughs> legging up the finishing yeah, straight. Yeah, I have to run as quickly as possible to do the uh, the first interview for international for all the all, yeah. the, all the TVs. It's so everyone's got something very quickly, and then yeah. all the individual countries try and so, get there. Yeah, so either in French or in English or, or or in Spanish if it's a Colombian, uh, and it was last year. And yeah, that's also an, an, a nice moment to be able to to speak with the with, with the winner and and the yellow jersey and um, try to. Uh, I'm a bit cheeky here, but try to get some tears out of him. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, 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 and for the last two, two years, it's, it's worked. Ah, Geraint Thomas cried. Egan Bernal cried. Oh, let's see if you can keep your record going yes. then in 20. Do you think the route is tear-inducing or will be for some of them? The route's going to be amazing next year. The course is going to be fantastic, especially because it starts from Nice, and that's where, 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 where I'm based most of the year. Uh, it's going to be extremely exciting, uh, a lot of mountains for people who like mountains, it's going to be great for people who don't like mountains, maybe less. Seems to be a, a new diet in terms of the stages and the tour, or increasingly the, the shorter, sharper, more dynamic stages. What Christian Prudhomme wants is to have uh, a variety of stages throughout the three weeks. He doesn't want to have five sprint stages in a row. So he will do what he can with his teams, with Thierry Gouvenou, to have a sprinter stage followed by a hilly stage, followed by a sprinter stage, followed by a mountain stage. And that's exactly what we'll see uh, next year. Um, Probably wants to see some different teams challenging, doesn't he, at the top? Well, no. Yes, a, bit, a, li yeah, a little bit. I mean, but again, it's, <laughs> it's the, riders, the riders are those who, 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 who make the difference. I mean... Um, the, the ASO are not going to design a tour for this or that team mm. or a tour against this or that team. So, no. You never know what's going to happen in a race like the tour, of course. And um, that was illustrated this year. We were sitting in the finishing line at Team. Um, the race was really kicking off. Egan Bernal had attacked. He was off up the road. It was re the race was really on. And then suddenly, there are all these signs alongside him. Rumours? No, no, no. Yeah, rumours that... The race was... Well, the first thing that I saw was what looked like a snowy scene from a helicopter. And I thought, well, I wonder where the helicopter's gone to get that. It must be somewhere else in the Alps because where we were was no more than 15K, 20K from where the riders were, and it was dry. So I, I was actually quite confused for a few seconds. I'm not as confused as Egan Bernal probably was when he when he was told to slow down. Talk us through that and yeah. that, how that sort of, well, uh, how that developed. It, it was an extraordinary it, stage, wasn't it, when the, the stage was, was annulled? Yeah, it was, um, it was shortened. Shortened, sorry, yeah. Um, it happened... Luckily for Bernal, it still counted. Abs absolutely, and, and it could have made a big difference. It started more or less three kilometers from the Isar. We started getting information that, um, that there were very... There were very bad weather conditions, and that mm, there was there was hail, and that um, and that maybe the stage would be shortened. We started getting information three kilometers from the Isiron. Bernal was already at the at the front, I believe, and very quickly we have to start anticipating things. So three kilometers from the the summit, um, I, I I I asked my three info motorbikes that you saw on the screen to go to the top of the Isiron and to take times just in case, just in case. Go to the top of the Isran and take time from the first to the, uh, as many time, time gaps as possible at the top of the Isran if the race is canceled at the top. And so that's what we started doing. Uh, the race carried on. We were still getting bad information, uh, I mean, information on bad weather conditions as we were going up on a sp specific uh, channel. 
speaking with Christian Prudhomme, speaking with someone who was at the front of the race, and it was getting worse and worse, and we got to the top of the Rizran, started going back down, race was still on, and with a uh, just after a kilometer of, of downhill, we were told we have to, we have to stop the stage, we have to, uh, to, to neutralize the stage, uh, the riders will not be able to go through in 10 kilometers, where there was a, a landslide, uh, and uh, so we, it was actually pretty calm because we, we'd anticipated things pretty well, I think. We had the times at the top of the Isran. There was a possibility of stopping the stage at the top of, of that climb. And so, yeah, so we, uh, we, we gave the information on race radio uh, to the team managers, asking the team managers to tell their riders that the race will be neutralized and stopped at the top of the Isran. Um, obviously, the riders never listen to their team managers because they carry on racing, and that's what they're, I mean, they're, they're racers. They want to race, and they won't take any information for granted. So it was pretty I hard. I mean, the leaders would need something like Christian Prudhomme's car alongside them, oh, yeah. telling them, wouldn't oh, yeah. they? Oh, yeah, to absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what happened, actually. I mean, Christian had to go to the front to tell Bernal, listen, it's, it's neutralized, we can't carry on. Yeah. And, um, and, and things were actually settled pretty quickly. Uh, were there dissenting voices among some of the teams? I mean, I presume... No, well, uh, I, I, on the moment, yes, of course, because, yeah. again, they're, they're races, they want to race. I think when they got back, back to their hotels and saw the footage, they said, oh, right, that, was, that was a pretty good decision. <laughs> how, cha how chaotic was it overnight um, following that oh, stage? Yeah. Because we had the, what was going to be the big final mountain stage of the tour. It was, it was the set piece, wasn't it? The, the grand finale of the race, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't completely curtailed, but how did that sort of... A little bit. Did you know straight very quickly that you were going to have to miss out whole chunks of it because of landslides, and we were basically going to have the one final climb? Well, there were the, those hours were long hours after the race, actually, uh, in uh, race headquarters, uh, on whether to decide uh, if we were, would actually cancel the stage, the, the following stage, completely or shorten it, and uh, indeed, there, there were parts of that stage where, the, we, where we, we, we just couldn't go through, uh, and I think around nine o'clock, the decision was taken to uh, shorten the stage to, I think it was about 65 kilometers, I think, yeah. uh, uh, getting rid of the Cormier de Roseland and another climb. So, yeah, it was, I mean, it's obviously disappointing because you want a grand finale, but uh, that was the yeah. only And it's not unprecedented, is it? I remember yeah. in 95, 96, we had a similar thing where they couldn't go over the Galibier. 95, I wasn't born then. Yeah, yeah anyway. <laughs> no, but, but um, it, it, was, it was hectic during that evening, but even the next morning, at the start of the stage, there were still rumours the race is going to be cancelled, the stage is going to be cancelled, yeah. so many things that you could see on Twitter. Well, we were sitting at the stage finish and just rivers of water. We, well, I say at the stage finish, because of the nature of... of there's a, a lot of infrastructure with the finish of the Tour de France, so depending on where the stage finish is, um, they work out what they can put near the finishing line because there's only so much room. So a lot of the TV and radio commentary boxes were actually a little bit further down that climb, not quite at the summit, but just rivers of water, you know, Val tents Torres. at the side of the road looking like they're about to be washed away. And we were hearing rumours at various points that it wasn't going to happen at all. I mean, how touch and go was it? Or was it always it going to be on? It was pretty touch and go. Uh, two hours before the start, it was there. There, there, there. I mean, there, uh, Christian Prudhomme and Thierry Gouvenou uh, were having meetings with the police on whether to have the stage or not. So, yeah, honestly, two hours before, it was, there, yeah, nothing was decided, but it went well. It was a great tour, and we had a we had an exciting winner, winner in Egan Bernal, and a great effort from uh, Geraint Thomas in defence of his crown, mm -hmm. particularly given the year he'd had. No Chris Froome at, at this year's Tour de France. Um, horrible crash that he was involved in earlier in the year. And, and I gather you uh, were on site pretty quickly. Yes, I was, yeah. Um, I would have preferred not to be on site. To yeah, be honest, that couldn't have been a pretty sight. No, and um, yeah, uh, so it was on that uh, time trial during the Dauphiné. And uh, traditionally, I, w I always get in the car to follow the first rider. Normally, I'm at this, the finish line just to give the times, but I always follow the first rider. So we started following the first rider, and after one or two kilometers, uh, a phone call from uh, the medic, from the, doc the doctor, saying well, there's been a crash on the on the course. Can you please go to the crash as quickly as possible because we have to secure the the, the site. And we had it with Chris Froome, and so we immediately got got on on site. Uh, it was maybe five minutes after he he'd crashed. 
And yeah, and we got there and he was lying down. An ambulance was already on site. He was lying down uh, against a wall uh, in pain, but still conscious and still speaking with his stuff, this, this, uh, the, the, the stuff from Sky, sorry, Ineos, where, um, where already on site and... Uh, but it wasn't a racing incident, was it? It was. It was. He, it was been, a training. It yeah, was, yeah, and he hadn't the wind just caught his front wheel or something. He, he, he was. He was blowing his nose he, or yeah, something. Yeah, he was. He, he was on his bike. He was going downhill, so probably at 60, 70 kilometers an hour, and he, he yeah, he was blowing his nose, so he had one only one hand on the the handlebar, and uh, we were going through a village, going downhill. And suddenly, the village stopped, and there was like a, a, air would go through, wind would go through, and sent him to the ground and he, he crashed at 70 kilometers an hour straight in the, into a wall. It's funny because I, I was having a chat with Chris uh, three weeks ago and he doesn't have, remember anything and he said, well, how high was the wall? Was, was it a little wall? Was it a big wall? And I said, well, it was, it was big. It was big enough. <laughs> It's a pile of rubble now, but yeah, it yeah. <laughs> no, but, well, no, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about this because yeah. it, there were so many stupid rumors on, on Twitter and on, on social media on the fact that he crashed on purpose because there were, there were I mean, anti doping controllers uh, at the finish waiting for me. I mean, seriously, it was, I mean, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a terrible crash, uh, it happened in a, a terrible way, and he was in serious pain. The ambulance stayed on site for two hours. They couldn't take him to hospital because they had to start um, operating when you, when you break your leg. They started uh, uh, yeah, operating in the ambulance. They couldn't take him to, 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 to the hospital. Um, it's going to be fascinating to see how it goes for him, isn't it? Because I think many people wouldn't come back from the injuries that he's had. Not but if at anybody his age can, as well. Yeah, but if anybody can, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's Chris Froome. Um, I want to finish on a, on, a, on a lighter note, a higher note. Um, You've had uh, a, lot of, a lot of tours of, uh, under your belt now. That obviously wasn't one of the good days, admitting not in the tour, but in the Dauphiné. Is there one day that you can remember where everything went, where, where the race was great, where you called everything the way that you wanted to, that it all fitted together and you thought, yep, yeah, this is it, this is great? There are, I, I, I can't, I can't. Point one out, yeah. one not well, one, one day stage on the tour the that you other. enjoyed most of all. Well, I I, I have to admit that uh, it was on my first tour, uh, and what, we were going uphill into Courchevel, and I I was sitting there behind all the favourites. The guy you, wearing the yellow jersey was American, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. I'm the luckiest man on earth. I'm watching the Tour de France from the best possible seat, and I have the stars that basically are. <laughs> 10 meters in front of me. That's one day I will remember, despite the yellow jersey. Um, and then, and in, then in terms of, of work and how works goes, uh, I think the, uh, the, 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 the main satisfaction you get from your work comes not necessarily from the tour, but from Paris-Roubaix. I, I work on Paris-Roubaix, and that's the, the most challenging race of, of, of the season. And when you get out of the car at the end of the, 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 the race and everything's worked out, you've given the times, you've, you've, you've You've, you've given the information, that's a massive satisfaction, probably bigger than any, any Tour de France stage. Oh, that's very good. Um, before you go, I think we've got a, an important little presentation to make, is that right? Uh, absolutely, yeah? absolutely. Oh la la. I'll hand over to you for a, yeah, for a moment or two now, Seb. Yeah, uh, should I stand up? I'm going to stand up, thank you very much. No, no, because basically I was, um, I was um, in China uh, hosting the UCI Cycling Gala. And there was a new award this year called the Fans Awards. Uh, so basically, they, the, the UCI posted four videos, uh, and the fans had to vote for the best video. It was called the, the Fans Awards. And the winners, I think, what the best thing is probably to see the video yeah. of, of who the winners are. It's definitely worth a watch. Do we have it? about to come. It's really spectacular. It's worth waiting half a minute for. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, it's a, yeah. Maybe we can have a strip tease from some Brotherson before. Here we go. Here we go. No, no, that's not the one. But that was that was really good as well. Yeah. <laughs> that was really Maybe good. not worth watching twice, but decent, Seb, yeah. You know what? Exactly. So the, yeah. <laughs> the fans the award. Was, was, uh, so there were four videos, and the winners this year, and I think you probably all know them, are the Beef Eaters. 
represented by a beef eater. So I was really... Uh, Bonjour, monsieur. Hey. Great to have you. Voila, this is, well, this is yours. Thank you very much. And... Um, no, because it, no, it's, 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 it's good to have fans awards, and it's, it's, it's great to have, uh, to, to, to have the beef eaters on stage, although you're not dressed up. I'm very Absolutely not. <laughs> um, now, what's really important to say is that um, it just shows how cool cycling is and how fun it is. And when, you, when you'll see the video eventually, you'll see uh, that I mean, families gathered, gather on the Tour de France, friends are together to dance, to enjoy the show, and to respect the riders. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's the idea. I mean, you really have fun organizing those moments. How did it start, actually? Uh, it goes back to 2009. There was um, a couple of guys we know went down to the tour, and um, they saw people dressed in fancy dress, and they thought, how do we uh, identify ourselves as British fans? So they went dressed as beef eaters. And then um, they did that for a few years. And then in 2013, we went on a, uh, we all got together and went on a cycling weekend in Yorkshire. We were sitting around the table one night and um, one of the guys said, look, it's the Grand Depart in Yorkshire yeah. in 2014. Why don't we all get dressed up? And we'll, um, we'll get some music on and try and create a party atmosphere. And yeah, um, yeah it's been, ever since then, it's just got bigger and bigger. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, so it's massive now. I mean, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's, we don't want it to get too big. <laughs> it's been great because you sort of you get about 50 or 60 people with you all day and um, you really get to know them yeah you know, know you have dancing bananas dancing exactly dinosaurs. yeah exactly yeah we lucked out with that dinosaur this year that was uh, that was really lucky but um yeah there's there's people we still keep in contact like um, gendarmes we still know them really yeah. In contact. yeah yeah so the french people are actually nice they are yeah yeah they're fantastic <laughs> as far as we're concerned they are anyway yeah <laughs> um what are the plans for next year where where where, where will we see the beef eaters um Tour of Flanders, hopefully. Oh, um, tour to Yorkshire, and obviously the tour. Where on the tour? Uh, probably, it's not guaranteed. Uh, Grand Colombia. Okay, that's yeah, pretty, that's pretty, uh, pretty decent. Yeah, yeah. You and think we'll there'll be uh, rain like in Yorkshire? <sighs> that was just hideous, wasn't it? <laughs> well, Simon, video time or? Are we good? Are we good to go with the video? We're good to go. We're, good well, to go. Uh, we're getting another one. Yeah. I don't recognize you. Look at that, that's me there. <laughs> Dancing banana. No, no, sorry, no, sorry. It's coming, it's, it's coming now. <laughs> Still makes me laugh. Voilà. Ah, there we are. Good videos come to those who Thanks wait. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, put yeah. your hands together for the beef eaters and for Seth PK. Merci, monsieur. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just get a picture. Voilà. Thanks. Uh, uh, coming